During Sabbath school, we spoke about thanksgiving. And Dan shared with us this very powerful concept. That, of course, comes from Scripture. Paul, speaking to the church, tells them to be thankful. And there's so many things to be thankful, right, brothers and sisters? Do you have things to be thankful? I know Dan and Karen are thankful that they're, uh, Danny's here and Sandra's here. And I am thankful today, too, because of Carolina. And tomorrow, we're going to have our sixth year anniversary. Amen? Amen. And I think Joe and Andrea, also during this month, yes. Um, I believe um, um, Michelle's birthday was this month. I think Liz also, Flora's um, birthday. Um, um, tomorrow, Benny and George's anniversary. Amen? So, so, so July seems to be a very special month. And so we have lots to be thankful for. And I praise God for, for the opportunity to, to worship with each one of you on the Sabbath morning. The title of my sermon is Unmoved. Unmoved. What do you think of when you hear that word unmoved? Solid. Fixed unchanged. Not too many things in this world that are like that, right? It would be hard for us to, to, to think of anything that doesn't change in our world. In fact, too many things are changing a little too fast, wouldn't you say? Too fast. And you might feel sometimes like, wow, this is getting worse by the day. Instead of change for the better, it's change for the worse. And I, it might be in business, it might be in the family, it might be even at church. And we see these powers that are moving, shifting things around us. And we might be feeling like, God, this is going too fast for me. Slow it down. I don't know if I can hold on any longer. Here in Southern California, we, 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 we know about mountains moving, don't we? Earthquakes. Um, it was about 10 years ago. 1990, no, more than 10 years ago. Wow, 1992. That's 20 years ago now. Wow, what happened? So I was a camp counselor in 1992, believe it or not. And um, I went to Pine Springs Ranch, and we had this... Um, group meeting before um, having all the kids come up to camp that week and all of a sudden during our meeting I just felt like wow I'm getting dizzy here now no and it started to move and it's everybody's like oh it's an earthquake it's an earthquake okay so everybody just stood still but 10 seconds went by and got harder and harder and and 20 seconds went by and it didn't stop 30 seconds. What's going on? So everybody just sat down, you know? And they said, let's, let's sit down. It was a 7.1 magnitude. It was in Landers, California, close to Joshua Tree, not too far from camp. And everybody felt that earthquake. You heard it as well. It roared right through the valley. And it got louder and louder. And as I sat there that day, thought, wow, I'm standing, I'm sitting on something that is at least a thousand times heavier than me, this huge mountain. You would probably say a million times, right? A million times heavier, and it's moving, it's shaking. I thought that was it. Well, we went to our room that morning, around 2 a.m., 3 a.m., I felt my bed was moving again. This time it was a 6.1 aftershock in San Bernardino, moving my bed. And I thought, oh, it's just another earthquake, you know? <laughs> so you just lay there. You don't want to get up. It's too early, right? So it's just, oh, it's going to stop. And it's like, you start hearing the walls, <laughs> you know, moving back and forth. And you're like, wow, this is a big building. And it's moving like this. I better get out of bed. So I got out of bed and everybody else got out of bed. But we understand these, these forces that shake, that move. Not just in the natural, physical world, but also in the spiritual world. 
And we as a church, we believe that there will come a time when everything will shake. Everything that can be moved will be moved. And you might ask the question, who will be able to stand? Who will be able to hold on? I know we don't all like change, do we? I have three, four little neighbors, about one, two, three, you know? And they're changing rapidly. They're growing fast. But as they grow, they let the neighbors know they're not always happy, you know? Eh, at 7 a.m., eh, at 7 p.m., eh, at 12, you know, every time. You know, they're, they're letting us know. It's, it's uncomfortable, uncomfortable to, to grow, to, to change. I, myself, being a pastor's kid, we, we, we moved a lot then. We, we moved. And it was back in the days when every two or three years you moved. And, and I could remember every time just going, why? Why do we have to change again? Why do we have to go to another state? Why do we have to go to another church? Why do we have to go to another school? Why do we have to have new neighbors? That question in me was, was always there. And, and mom would somehow find a way to talk to this three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And as I grew, I still complained. Um, mom would say, Sam, God has a plan. And it's always for the better. I would look at her and go, really? <laughs> it's always for the better. God has a plan. And I would like to share with you this morning God's plan for you and me. It's found in the book of Psalms, Psalms 46. It begins by telling us who will be unmoved, who will be unchanged, even if things around us start tumbling, crumbling down. Verse 1 begins by saying, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Amen? Amen? He is our refuge. He is the one who gives us strength. And the text tells us here, he is the source of help. He's an inexhaustible source of help. God is our refuge and strength. These words were put to a hymn by Martin Luther, German um, reformer. Ein festes Burg ist unser Gott. A mighty fortress is our God. Amen? He
might, a God who is awesome. There are other psalms also, like the psalms of lamentation. And what do those express? Sadness. They express difficulty. They express um, turmoil. They express fear of death. And, and those are experiences we all have, right? Correct? And is God willing to listen to those songs as well, brothers and sisters? He, he's willing. He's, he's willing to listen to those songs. And then, there, of course, there are the songs of thanksgiving. And we talked about it in, in Sabbath school, how important it is to be thankful, especially after God has saved us from such a difficult situation. Um, the psalmist expresses his gratitude toward God by expressing it in a psalm of thanksgiving. Verse 4 changes a little bit, and, and it expresses something here. It says, there is a river. Now, a river is a lot calmer than the sea, correct? All of those who have been here to the Pacific Ocean, we, we know how rough it can get out there. The waves can get pretty high, and, and the strength of, of the, the current is, is also to be um, experienced and felt. But here it talks about a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And my question to you is, what makes you glad? What makes you happy? What is the Bible talking here about? A river, a stream that makes the city of God glad, that makes God's people happy. Would you like to know? I think the text tells us, and we're going to get there in just a moment, but I'm going to hold on to, to, to the, the answer, and I'm going to, I'm going to share it with you in, in a very, um, very, very soon. Um, water, is it important for Southern California? It's extremely important. I mean, that's how we grow our avocados, correct? That's how we grow our, our gardens. That's how, how everything around us looks actually green. And yes, we're in the middle of the desert, but because of water, um, there's the source of life. We see things around us transform. The flowers bloom. Everything looks beautiful when there is water. And so we find that, that this river whose streams make glad must be some type of living water, something that just brings happiness to God's people. And then it continues saying, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. And verse 5, God is in the midst of of her she what shall not be moved she shall not be moved god's in the midst of her all this is happening mountains are slipping into the ocean the earth is quaking everything around us is shifting at a rapid speed but there's no fear because god is in the midst of her. He's there. He's present. He's not oblivious. He has not gone away. He's not forgotten his people. And therefore, they shall not be moved. It actually says, God will help her when morning dawns. How many did, did morning come too soon today? Yes, for, for us, yes. Uh, it comes for me always too early. Uh, dawn, all of a sudden it lights up. And, and, and especially if you're living out here in Temecula, the sun comes out really quickly. If you're on the coast, there's a lot of fog, so it takes a little while. But, but God says, I'm going to help you quickly. Trust me. I can help you. Don't go anywhere else. Don't put your trust in people. Don't put your trust in what you have. Don't put your trust in, in what you know. Put your trust in God. Amen. He's in the midst of his people. The text continues saying, The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. They moved. They shaked. When they saw this, they, they were desperate. And... and Somebody said, Pastor Sam, did you look at Psalms chapter 2? I said, no, I didn't. So I want to invite you just to look there really quick. Psalm chapter 2. And there's a question that the psalmist asks here. Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. And this is the question. Why are the nations in, a, in an uproar and the people 
devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against who? And against his anointed. There's rage on earth when these things are happening. People are angry at who? At God. And not only at God, but also at his anointed, Jesus, the Christ. They're mad. All around them, it's, it's falling apart, and, and they, they can only find God to blame. Let's go back to Psalm 46. What does God do? Verse 6 says, He raised His voice. The earth did what? Melt it. And I want to give you a clue. I believe this river of life is tied to the voice of God. Okay? This river that goes into the city of God is tied with His voice. Um, in other um, passages of, of the Psalms, you find God's voice, and sometimes it's translated as God's thunder. Pretty powerful, amen? And the text here describes it as the earth melts away. There's nothing that is not moved when God speaks. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that God wants to move our hearts today, amen? He wants to melt them in such a way that we will say, God, thank you. Thank you for all that you give us. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for taking care of my family. Thank you because I am here today. Thank you because I can worship you. And his voice is heard. Verse 7, the response is, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. This phrase, the Lord of hosts is with us, sounds so much like Emmanuel, God with us. But it adds the name here, the God of who? Why Jacob? Did, Jacob had a, did he have an easy life? Or did he have a hard life? Did he have some big struggles? He did, especially when he was about to meet his brother. Remember that? He, he knew that this was not going to turn out good. He felt like everything that he had worked so hard for was going to disappear in a matter of minutes. His brother was coming to kill him and his family, and he knew it. His brother was still mad, angry. But what did Jacob do at that moment? Did he say, okay, let's everybody let's beef up and, and get our weapons ready and let's prepare because we're going to fight back? Was that his, his answer? No. Who did he seek for? He sought for God in prayer and said, God, I will not let you go until you fulfill your promise to me. God, you said you would make a nation out of me. God, you said you would bless people through me. And you can't do that if I'm dead. You can't do that. God, keep your promise. Does God keep his promises? Amen. He does. He told Jacob, Jacob, you will no longer be Jacob. Now you'll be Israel. A conqueror. Unmoved by the things that are happening around you. The last section of Psalm 46, verses 8 through 11, is an invitation from God to all nations. And he says, Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolation in the earth. What does he do? He makes war to seize to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Does God love war? No, he hates it. And he will put an end to war. Amen? On that great day, he will, war will cease to exist. He will break every bow, every spear, every chariot will, will, bor, bor, will burn. And verse 10 tells us, cease striving. He's telling this to the nations. Cease moving. Cease doing your own will. 
and know that I am God. Amen. Know that I am the creator. Know that I am the redeemer. Why can't we accept that? Why can't we acknowledge that? Why is it so hard for us human beings to, 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 to just not see what God is doing for us on a daily basis? And this is what God is inviting these nations. Stop it. Stop your wars. Stop your transactions. And know that I am God. And he tells them the end of the story. The end of the story, brothers and sisters, is not chaos. The end of the story is not just total destruction. The end of the story is not total desolation. The end of the story is presented here in verse 10. It says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Amen. That is God speaking to these nations, telling them that he will win at the end. On whose side do you want to be? On God's side, wouldn't you? I, I want to be on that side. God inviting us all to acknowledge that he is God. And the psalm finishes by saying, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Unmoved, unchanged, God's people who trust in him in the midst of all this chaos. So going back to the question, what is this river of life? What is it? And I want to invite you to open your um, Bibles to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. This is very important right here. It begins by saying, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. He doesn't take counsel from they, them, the nations. But his delight is in what? The law. the law of the Lord. And in his law, in his word, he meditates day and night. And then he compares such a man to something. And this is where it jumped out at me. He says, and he will be like a tree firmly planted by what? by the rivers of water, by streams of water. As I read this, I said, wow, this is a pretty healthy tree. How many of you have one of those trees? Um, as a kid, I, I, I loved to just go up a tree. And the tree that we had in our backyard, it was higher than this roof right here, the ceiling. It was just, it went up. And I was, I think, seven, eight, no, I was eight, nine, now, and, and I would go up that tree, and I would just sit at the top of that tree and look around me and just let the wind blow and just sway me back and forth. And I was so glad that this tree was a healthy tree by streams of water, yes. It was green. It was strong. I knew nothing would move it out of its place. And so are those who put their trust in God. So are those who take time to meditate on His Word, unmoved. God is saying, take time to study my Word. It will make you glad. It will make you happy. In fact, it says what happens to, to the wicked. Verse 4, the wicked are not so, but they are like what? Chaff. They're like tumbleweed. They're like super dry. And the wind comes, and where do they go? With it. Anywhere. Exactly. They're, they're moving constantly. That, that's the, the opposite. They, they're not by streams of water. They put their confidence, their trust in themselves and thus they are driven here and there. In verse 5 it says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Do you want to stand in the assembly of the righteous? 
I want to stand in the assembly of the righteous. I, I want to be glad in the Lord. I want to meditate in his word. And Jesus gives us a promise. And I conclude with this promise found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. If you have your Bibles, open it to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. And it says like this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, what words? Jesus' words. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them and does them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and burst against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded upon the rock. Amen? God's word is still able to hold each one of us, still able to help us in moments of difficulty, is still able to sustain the weight of this world. If we will take the time to read it, if we will take the time to put it into practice, will you do that with me? Will you continue to study God's word? Trust God and what he said he will do. This will bring us through those difficult times. And by God's grace, we will be unmoved. Amen.